Welcome to the champagne tasting. Sorry for that uh, little delay. Um, so yeah, thanks for joining us. I know we have uh, people from all across the nation in multiple time zones. So uh, you know, hope you're all uh, ready to drink some champagne and uh, learn about it in the process. So before I get started with the uh, bottles themselves, uh, Simon Lambert, our uh, senior wine specialist is going to uh, give you a little intro. So good evening and welcome to everyone. So let me start with a statement. Champagne is sparkling wine, but sparkling wine is not always champagne. That's because to be called champagne, the wine has to be made and grapes grown in a specific geographic region delineated by law in France, which is about Champagne's about 90 miles um, northeast of Paris. So go to Paris when we're allowed out of the outside world again, jump on a train, you can do a day, day visit to Champagne. Very specific um, rules apply, and I'm sure Silas will go into, go into this in a lot more detail than I. Um, but the Champagne region is one of the most northerly grape growing regions in the, in the Northern Hemisphere. And at about 50 degrees north, so it's, it's up there in line with Manitoba, for example, slightly different climate. Um, and it means the grapes have a pretty hard time to ripen, which for um, making regular table wine is not a good thing. But for champagne, what you'll end up with are grapes that have high acidity and a relatively low uh, potential alcohol of about 10%, ideal for making champagne. Um, I'm sure Silas will explain how the bubbles get in there, but initially um, it was a mistake. It was um, wines going through secondary fermentation in bottle, and it was discovered that, in fact, they now had bubbles. Problem was, of course, the bottles were breaking, the corks were flying out, and then eventually they came up with the cage and the cork that we see today. Um, it's, it was um, a while before that happened, but now as, as things ha are today, we'll see a, a tremendous uh, range of some phenomenal champagnes, uh, three of which we will be tasting tonight. And I just want to quote from Hugh Johnson, the, the famous English uh, wine writer, who said, it would be claiming too much to say that all champagne is better than any other sparkling wine, but, the very best champagne has a combination of freshness, richness, delicacy, and raciness that no other sparkling wine from anywhere in the world has. So with that little introduction, let me hand you back to Silas, and he will guide us through these three champagnes. Enjoy. Thanks, Simon. So uh, I don't want to keep you guys waiting too long. You know, you got to have something in your, in your glass. So let's go ahead and jump right in. We're going to start with the uh, Pierre Gemenet. This is from uh, the village of Cui. So let's go ahead and open it if you haven't already. <laughs> so if I see if my. Uh... Yes. Um, yeah, that was that was correct. As they it's say, restaurant uh, quality. No, it's no restaurant louder. quality, Silas. Oh, thank you, thank you. It should be no louder than a baby's fart, as they say. Okay. You wait till you become a father. No. <laughs> um, so yeah, this is so this is a Chardonnay, and this is from uh, what they call the Cote de Blancs. And I will show you a map in a second, just to give you a little lay of the land in Champagne. Uh, and so within Champagne, there's uh, people debate on how many regions and subregions there are. And I'm actually gonna make it a little bit of a different speaker view so you can see. Okay. So yeah, there's uh, people debate on how many subregions there are, but no matter what, how you break it up, there are specific areas that just over centuries have, uh, they've realized that specific grapes suit the soil and the climate better. So in a specific area just south of the main uh, kind of hub of Champagne, 
is the Cote de Blancs. And it's a long limestone uh, escarpment. And uh, here, I'll just, I'll just go ahead and share my screen so you guys can all see it. Um, All right, so we have here, this is Northern France, there's Paris, and you can see, I mean, there's really, north of here is very, very cold area um, up towards the English Strait, uh, English Channel. Um, there's really no other growing areas around it. There's, you know, over here is the, is Alsace and that is, you know, a climatic anomaly that they can actually ripen grapes that well over there. Up here, we're north of Paris a little bit actually, and it, it, it's quite cold around here. So as you zoom in, you can see, I, I've kind of marked out all the, uh, all the sites we're gonna to explore today, but you see this long kind of ribbon of forest, and that actually traces the backside, that traces the backside of what they call the, the, the coast of Blancs, the Cote de Blancs. And these villages are all almost entirely planted in Chardonnay. And for some reason, and you know, people say, you know, these east facing slopes, the, the, the rising sun like Chardonnay. And, you know, you get past the romantic sentiment of that statement, there is something to say about east facing slopes get the sunshine earlier in the day. So it tends to drive off, uh, you know, moisture from the night. Uh, it gives you, uh, you know, photosynthesis before the heat of the day, because obviously it's going to be hotter in the later part of the day when the sun is beating down on the west slopes. So, uh, and this is also a very, very chalky soil. This outcrop, what makes these mountain, these hills, I should say, uh, are just thick beds, very, very thick beds a very fine chalk. And this was part of what you call the Paris Basin, and that's a geologic term. Uh, it's a massive ancient, um, ancient basin, pretty much. So a big you know, depression that uh, was once under oceans and uh, through different uh, organic processes like oolites and, and shell buildup or even uh, coral reefs. It, it wasn't quite that warm up here, but uh, you know this uh, calcium carbonate, which is limestone, built up in these massive, massive sections. If you think of the cliffs of Dover, that is, uh, that is the same geologic formation that you'll see here, and is why they're actually starting to re-experiment, revitalize English wine, the English wine industries, because they, they share very similar soils. So if this is the ribbon of the Cote de Blancs, we are way up here at the very tip of it. And this is the village of Cui. So all the grapes come from here. And if you notice, I've exaggerated the, the landscape a little bit so you can see ex exactly kind of where the hills are. It, it's still challenging because Champagne is, <laughs> it really doesn't have that much topography. It's pretty muted slopes. But you can see, here's, here's the outcrop that makes the that makes that coat. And these villages are Grand Cru. Cremont was Grand Cru, Elise is Grand Cru. Cui, not so much. And it, it, it's kind of a forgotten village in many a sense because it's north facing. And so it doesn't get, it doesn't get, it does get some of the, you know, early rays of sunshine, but it tends to be very cool. So it never achieves the real, you know, depth and complexity that would, you know, elevate it to a Grand Cru. But I really like it. So let me get my little screen share. So we'll go back to that in a second, but uh, let's go ahead and taste this. So in my mind, this is quintessential champagne. Mm. Right after the bat, right after the bat, I get chalk. That's what comes to mind. And, you know, I studied geology in school, specifically vineyard soils and soil scientists especially tend to gripe <laughs> about how you can't taste rocks. If you actually licked a piece of limestone, you would, not, you would not have the same taste in your mouth as this. 
But when you taste a wine like this from a limestone or very chalky soil, you get the sense that it's the best analogy that you can really think of. Uh, and there's, there's a lot of reasons for this, uh, this ongoing research. It's a very challenging thing to research because there's so many steps in winemaking that create the uh, flavors and aromas that we perceive in a finalized wine. It, it's, an, it's really challenging to control the variables and have any sort of you know, proof. But one thing can be said is the Cote de Blancs tends to produce these Chardonnays of focus and of minerality. And I, I absolutely love it. You also get just this perfect Granny Smith. It has relatively ripe fruit, but it's high toned. It's very acidic, but without being too biting. So I mentioned, I'm gonna have some more of this and this is great. Um, I mentioned this is a quintessential, what I see as a quintessential champagne. And if this is a quintessential champagne, it's a quintessential grower of the Cote de Blancs itself. Gimenez is a, a multi-generation grower producer, and I'll explain what a grower producer is. Um, and they produce almost 98% exclusively Chardonnay and in the Cote de Blancs. So they're really known for having just an incredible array of different micro terroirs, you know, village specific examples, plot specific examples of the Cote de Blancs. And it's an incredible way to really um, explore what makes this region special. And I, I'm a huge fan of the Chardonnays coming from Gimenez. And if you have a chance, it, it's an extraordinary way to just, yeah, but pu push your understanding of even what a quintessential uh, champagne can taste like. And one way to do that, and I highly recommend it, is to explore uh, the special club champagnes. And Gimenez, uh, I believe great grandfather, was actually one of the founding members of a group of growers that came together and they decided we need to push the boundaries of what champagne can do. You know, there was a, you know, a small grower producer mo movement, and I should just say, grower producers are small, you know, farmers who have over the, over the decades decided to not sell their grapes off to cooperatives or the large houses such as Moet Hennessy, you know, Dom Perignon, um, and instead produce and bottle their own wines under their family name. That is a literally grower producer. And so uh, there was this small, you know, community of grower producers, but they hadn't really broken through to the larger champagne markets in the, internationally, especially. So making this special club uh, group was designed to say, how can we, how can we push the boundaries of what people even understand of what we can do as, as small producers that have, you know, the big houses we will blend from hundreds of sites uh, across decades. These guys, um, this is not vintage, but it, it's based on one year. They don't have hundreds of tanks to blend across decades like say Krug does. They can't, they don't have the space or the money really to hold on to all that wine. And so even in a non-vintage wine, they are kind of hampered by the space and money. So it's, um, so yeah, this is multi-vintages. It says, uh, the, this is a half bottle. So the whole bottles might be a little different. But the half bottles are 2010 through 2017. And I, I guarantee you that is probably based on 90% one or two years. Um, and that's just, as I said, because of uh, space constraints. Um, Special Club, on the other hand, is exclusively vintage dated, uh, long aged champagnes. And not only that, they have to submit the wine once it's finished to their fellow club members and they're all tasted blind and only those that garner enough votes are actually allowed to be bottled as special club. So it's an extraordinary way to kind of taste the, the pinnacle of what uh, the grower producer community can make. So just an aside. Um, so yeah, I'm a huge fan of this wine. What, what do you uh, think Gerard and Simon? I love it. I think, I think it's, it's absolutely um, typical of, of what I would look for in, in a 100% Chardonnay from the Cote de Blanc. 
this this lovely, as you said, the green apple freshness. This there's, there's a minerality there, um, but a raciness as well. Um, that that but just just what if 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 you out there are wanting to buy um, a champagne that has this lively, fresh um, green apple style, then look for a, a Chardonnay, 100% Chardonnay from the Cote de Blanc. Yeah, so it's the thing you hit the nail on the head as far as, I mean, it's a fairly, I don't want to say straightforward because, you know, it almost sounds pejorative in that it's, you know, like it, it's a very complex wine, but the, the two most noticeable ones, I mean, obviously the minerality is, you know, unmistakable, um, but it's like super focused. Um, you know, it's funny because you know, on some wines, it's very, a, a wine that's very, you know, mouth coating and very rich and just very expansive. This to me is very, it's laser focused. I mean, I honestly don't feel it so much. Or I don't taste it so much on my entire palate. It's more just, you know, on the, on the, uh, on the insides of, of you know, uh, insides of the palate. And it just feels very precise and very straightforward in a, in a very, very positive way. And the, I mean, you hit the nail on the head with Granny Smith apple. I mean, to me, it tastes like an apple Jolly Rancher in a, in a good way. You know, I mean, it's just very unmistakable and it's a, it's a, it's a damn good one. Yeah. I, I, I think I agree. Well, the, the focus, ahead. a lot of people um, describe Jimenez style as, as linear. And I think that's a really, in, in, uh, I think this is an interesting way to approach wine is to think about it spatially, how it moves across your palate. And I totally agree. This is a laser focused, very linear wine. Not to say that it's short or, or too pinpointed, but it, it graces across the palate. It, it's almost like a, a, a train going down your throat instead of this big bulbous thing coming in your mouth, like say, a, you know, a Krug or something, it, it is focused. So I have this busy bee 102 would like to uh, ask real time. So the minerality is wonderful, but uh, doesn't taste much biscuit. What produces that in the champagne? Yes, and uh, so there's two things, you, the natural ripeness of, it, of the grapes. So in an especially you know, warm year or long, long season, you'll get more just natural, rich flavor from the grapes themselves. Um, there's also just the winemaking process, and that is the biggest thing. There's producers like uh, Bollinger, for example, that they ferment almost exclusively in oak barrels. And what that gives you is just much more textural richness. Uh, it gives you a little bit of micro oxidation. And by that, I mean a, a little bit of gas exchange in the process of actually the wine, the wine you know, being made in barrel. Barrel wood is slightly porous. So you're getting a little bit of gas coming in and out of the barrels themselves. And that gives you a, you know, a rounding out, a softening, uh, uh, the other thing is uh, a process called autolysis, and this is uh, aging on the leaves, which is the yeast sediment. And this is the, goes into the process uh, of champagne itself. So I mentioned this uh, briefly in my intro is that you're at the really the boundary of growing grapes in champagne. You know, in really bad years, it's really tough to even blend that into a future wine without it really dragging down the line. Um, and they've been blessed in the past couple of decades with, with climate change. They've been one of the winners of climate change in, in France in that they've had a string of very successful vintages. On the other hand, climate change is not you know, uniform in the sense that they are seeing you know, dramatic hail events. They're seeing drastic swings in temperature that can sometimes damage uh, you know, the whole crop if it happens during flowering. Um, but so you're at the edge of ripening. The base wine, when you make, a, a, when, you, when you take grapes and you press them, um, which we will taste one wine where they don't press them right away, but almost always you take the grapes when you pick them and you press them and you ferment the juice either in, you know, stainless steel or barrel, as I mentioned, and you get some, some natural richness from, from your choice in that process. But then there's the actual process of, you know, uh, of dose, uh, you, so you, you, you put a little bit of yeast slurry and a little bit of sugar on top of the, in a bottle with the base wine once it's done. And this is a very harsh wine to start. And, and there's a kind of a, a annual gathering of predominantly critics and connoisseurs who go to Champagne and taste what they call the Vinclair. 
and I, I haven't done it personally, I've always wanted to, I hear it's a punishing process because you're tasting really, really acidic wine, very acidic wine. And without the bubbles, it's just, it's just harsh. And it also has an age on the lees. So then they bottle it and they put it, and usually it's under a crown cap, like a beer cap. And they'll put a little bit of yeast slurry and a little bit of sugar. And that gives it the carbonation. And what they'll do, it, the choice then is how long do you age it in the lees? Because the lees themselves, you, you'll have a little bit of, uh, of re-fermentation in the bottle. And that's what gives you carbonation. But it also gives you dead yeast cells. And you can literally see it. It, it collects at the bottom of the, of the bottle. Um, if you've ever had like a natural wine, you can often see yeast sediment collecting. It tends to be brown, um, uh, different shades of brown. But anyway, the more you age, the longer you age it on the lees, they actually go through a self consumption phase called autolysis. And it releases um, compounds, amino acids, that then react in what, what is the same process as browning a steak. It's called the Maillard reaction. And that's where you get the really brioche notes. It's where you get the buttery notes. It's, it's pretty extraordinary. So there's some champagnes, and I highly recommend you seek these out because they're, they're fascinating champagnes. Uh, for instance, uh, uh, Champagne Parlant as uh, a grower producer that ages a multi-vintage uh, blend of, um, I think the lowest amount, lowest, yeah, so it's at least 10 years on the lease before they blend it. Um, it it's an extraordinary wine. It's, it's deep golden in color. It's very nutty. It's expansive. Still has the, the verb, the acid, the lift, the, the complexity, uh, that you would have in, in, in a baseline like this, but just so much more. So I hope that answered your question. Yeah. <laughs> so so just, just following on from that just for a second, because I'm getting thirsty, I need another glass of something different. Um, the, 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 the yeastiness, the depth of flavor, which as, as Silas said, comes from the wine aging on the, on the lees to a certain extent, because as the wine's fermented, so obviously the dead yeast cells collect in, in, in bottles. And so if you look on the back labels of, of what we have tonight, you'll see underneath some of the, the there's, there's a disgorgement and the date of the Jumene says 2019, uh, December 10th. So that is the date that this champagne was, the, um, the, the, the dead yeast cells were removed from the bottle, which is a technique in and of itself. Um, and then the, the the actual champagne cork, it, they top it up with a little bit of, of wine and then the champagne cork is actually pushed in. Um, if you want to get into the details of, of how they remove the, the dead yeast cells, one of us will be happy to tell you, but let's let's move on. <laughs> We're going to be too technical. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I do apologize. I, I have to say, um, you know, a little background. I, I've worked in the wine industry for many years. I kind of fell into it right out of high school, you know, growing up in Portland, Oregon, uh, working in the Willamette, and I, I've worked many aspects of the wine industry, and for some reason, I, I just have always loved champagne, and I, I shouldn't say for some reason, I think for a very valid reason, is that it, it has this, like, ineffable quality that just, it makes you, it makes you buoyant, it makes you, it challenges your palate, it, it's great with food, it's a wine that I never say no to. <laughs> I, I literally, and, and these guys will, will attest to this, is I drink a lot of champagne. <laughs> yeah. So let's move on. Um, so we're going to move on. We're going to go to uh, a different village, another. And I should say, you know, there's many regions and there's some up and coming far flung regions. We're kind of, we're hitting the big ones. We're hitting the, the heavy hitters the central regions, the heavily planted regions uh, that have inextricably tied to Champagne's history. So the, the, the Cote de Blanc is obviously a reference point. Now we're doing that Monte de Ra Ra I can never pronounce this. France. 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 Just, 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 <laughs> just, just, just so everybody knows, it's, it's spelled R-E-I-M-S on the map and it's pronounced Reims. So if ever you're traveling over there and you ask for directions to the city of Reims, nobody will know what you're talking about. 
<laughs> yeah, they'll, they'll at least pretend. They'll at least pretend. Yes. <laughs> so uh, we're going now to the Grand Cru village of, of Buzi. And this is just one of my favorite uh, regions because it's, or villages, I should say, because it, it's just, it's always ripe, uh, boisterous, really fun. So this is uh, Pierre Piard. Let's uh, give it a try. Mm. Yeah, right off the bat, I get, uh, you know, it's still, still probably, I would say a lot of apple, but it's riper apple. It's maybe a little bit of bruised apple. Maybe a little bit of pear. Really nice, really nice. A, a melange of fruits at different stages of ripeness, I'd say. Mm. So I'd say, you know, still some minerality, but must, much less of that pronounced chalk. It doesn't have that like, whoa, that is, that is Chardonnay from Cote de Blancs. This is much riper, much more fruit driven. It's much more, it, it's richer to say the least. Um, and let's take a look. Let's take a look at why. So this is, um, and this is predominantly also a, a Pinot Noir village. So they don't grow as much Chardonnay. It is. Uh, I'm going to share my screen again, but it's not too far away from Cote de Blanc. So they actually do grow uh, quite a bit of Chardonnay. It's about forty percent in the village. So from Cui. We're going to go up and go to the Monte de Rios. Monte de Rios. I can never pronounce it. So here we go. So here, Rons. So here is the actual mountain. So this is a, a national forest, and it creates this perfect slope that encapsulates uh, kind of this kind of skirt around the outcrops that grow some the best grapes in Champagne. So there's there's Grand Cru villages dotted up here, but down here at the south is Boozy. And the reason it's so ripe is because it's just this kind of bowl, this, this full big south facing slope. So it gets, you know, it gets lots of sunshine all day long. It gets uh, throughout the day, it's very ripe. Um, and it, 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 it's a beautiful rendition and tends to, tends to ripen more so than other villages. So you can see I've exaggerated the topography a little bit. It creates a little bit of a bolt too. There's some you know, lesser sites over here kind of tucked away to the west. Um, you have Embonet over here, which is also just a lovely village. But Boozy is, I think, a quintessential uh, uh, ripe <laughs> rendition of, of, of Chardonnay. Or sorry, of uh, no, Champagne. But, you know, dominated by Pinot Noir. This specific example, Yes, yeah, seventy percent Pinot, thirty percent Chardonnay. So, what do you think, Gerard and Sam? Well, for a start, I love the name of the village. <laughs> I mean, if, if you're going go, to have a wine village, it's got to be called Boozy. <laughs> um, this you can see from. I mean, the colour in this is deeper than than the previous, um, partly due to the the, the Pinot Noir, um, but. Remember, and maybe Silas will touch on this, I don't want to um, overstep what you're going to say, Silas, but with Pinot Noir and Champagne, with this Champagne, there's no color. And that's because when the grapes are pressed, the juices run off immediately, and there's no bleeding of the color from the skins into the grape. So it's just like you're taking a, a red table grape from the supermarket. If you cut it open, the flesh inside is not red. The flesh is is what we call white. It's you know greenish, amply color, and the juice would be the same color. So that's why there's no hint of of pink or any any what we would think of being a Pinot Noir color in this champagne. Um, the, the 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 weight of this is is so much more on the palate. Um, it, it's is yeastier on the nose. Um, it's complete contrast to the preceding wine. Both of which I think are lovely in totally different ways. Gerard? No, I, I totally agree. And I think these are, this is fun because obviously we're taking a, you know, more of a, a slightly more technical. I mean, obviously we're relaxed and having, you know, having fun and enjoying ourselves, but 
just from a technical aspect, this is really just this juxtaposition, this side by side is really, really interesting because, you know, you, it's not, it might, this difference might not be as pronounced if we were to, you know, have had, you know, first line, you know, now, and then come back and have, you know, the, the wine we're enjoying, you know, right now, tomorrow. I, I just think that it's, when you see it side by side within the span of 10 or 15 minutes, it's, it's so much, it's so obvious. And I think that, you know, Silas mentioned, you know, more of a bruised apple or a pear, you know, I think it almost has a, you know, certainly a baked apple quality to it. It's much richer, you know, what, whereas the, the, you know, the preceding champagne was far more linear. This is much more rounded. It's much more generous. You know, you could make the argument that this might be a little bit more crowd pleasing. Um, it's not to say that one is better than the other. I mean, I think they're, they're, this is just a really, really good, you know, intro and in, in, in these first two, but um, you know, I think that if I were to, pick a champagne that would be a little bit more crowd pleasing, um, you know, to the uninitiated. I think this one would be, this one would be my choice, but it's just really, really fun to taste these side by side. And obviously as we, as we, you know, transition into the third year shortly, I mean, I just think that it's uh, this is, this is a really, really good trio uh, of, you know, understanding, even for people who drink a lot of champagne, you know, like ourselves and, and, and you know, those who are joining. I mean, I think this is just a really, really good side by side by side, um, uh, experience for sure. So well done, Silas. And I think um, very food friendly, both of these. I mean, you know, we so many people just pop open a bottle of champagne on a special occasion as a toast. That's such a shame because these are such food friendly wines and particularly the second one, which has got the, the depth to it that will go with, with some fairly heavy, rich yep. dishes. Um, whereas the, the, the first, the Jumonet, probably more with oysters and, and some shellfish and the like, but uh, totally different, totally, absolutely delicious and really interesting to compare them side by side. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, uh, that's ultimately why I chose them. I think they're great representatives of the, the different terroirs, but also just a beautiful contrast, you know, just to see, uh, you know, it's really only a couple miles away from each other, but such different expressions uh, of, of Chardonnay, or oh, sorry, of Champagne. <laughs> and that's, you know, I should say the, a lot of grower producers argue that it's less so about the grapes themselves, about, you know, Americans, I, I think, are trained by our, our own industry in that we tend to, you know, label everything with the grape. And that that's great. I think it's, it, it especially as a culture that is still, you know, learning the ropes in terms of wine consumption and really uh, appreciating the, the nuances. Uh, it's nice to know that you're, you're buying a few more, but the reason a lot of these people won't, you know, give you the breakdown of, of what they put in to their champagnes is because they, they don't care. They'd rather give you the site. They'd rather tell you, oh no, this is from, this is from the Cote de Blancs, and it, it, it might have a smidgen of, of Pinot Noir in it, it because that whatever site they, they have just better suits uh, Pinot Noir. Uh, a perfect example of this is uh, Larmonier Bernier, uh, a grow producer in the southern portion of the Cote de Blancs, and they actually do have a couple sites that are planted in Pinot Noir, and they argue that um, th that specific slope, that break in the slope, whatever it may be, that soil, maybe it's a little bit more clay heavy. It just, they felt that it was more suited to Pinot Noir, even though it was rather taboo not to plant Chardonnay. Um, with that said, I should say, and uh, Simon mentioned this, this is a, one of the most heavily regulated um, regions in all of France. They, uh, to the point where they have to prune a specific way, they have to, uh, their dates of picking are scheduled and mandated by law. So you cannot, you know, pick before and you cannot pick after specific dates. And it, it's just extraordinarily, uh, in some, and some argue onerous in the sense that it, it can stifle experimentation. Uh, with that said, we, we, we've tasted two of the major grapes. There is also, we'll touch on the you know, prevalence of, of Pinot, Pinot Meunier uh, in a second. Uh, so three major grapes in Champagne, but there's actually seven allowed in the Appalachian. 
and there's a growing movement, I shouldn't say growing, a small movement of producers that are exploring, especially with climate change, uh, what these other varieties can provide. And th that's a, a surprising avenue of, of actual latitude within, within the AOC of, of Champagne, that the, the appellation and all the legal framework of Champagne. So uh, if you wanna know more about that, let, let me know. There's a, there's a deep dive world of the, the, uh, the forgotten varieties. Um, so yeah, I, I, I say we, we go ahead and, and move yeah. on to, oh, go ahead. There was a question I did see, it seems to have disappeared. I can't see. Um, somebody was asking about um, how often do you see, oh yeah, there we go. How often do you see Pinot Noir Extra Brut? Well, the Extra Brut is bone dry. That's the driest of all of the champagnes. Um, bearing in mind that this is not 100% Pinot Noir, there's, Ch there's Chardonnay in here, but there is a tendency more these days, I think, to, to produce a drier style of wine. Um, much of which is dependent upon the dosage that they add at the time of the secondary fermentation. Um, but I think it's, it's more and more seen these days. Silas? I, I totally agree. And uh, there's a lot of debate actually in, in champagne enthusiasts about dosage. And, it, you know, some people say, oh, I don't want, I don't want like a sweet champagne. You know, I, I don't want, you know, multiple grams. I shouldn't say dosage is... Uh, how they kind of balance the final wine. They'll add a little bit of sugar uh, after disgorgement to kind of just uh, really add that final touch to honestly the work of art. And, uh, you know, this, the Payard, for example, is relatively low dosage. It's what 1.8 grams per liter. That's relatively low. You know, a, a, a common dosage for say a Bollinger is eight grams per liter. Um, and there's a lot of grower producers who are saying, you know, brute zero. Uh, I'm not dosage. I'm not doing any dosage whatsoever. You know, those producers tend to be down south. They tend to be in a region that I'll, I'll kind of talk more about at the end, which is the, uh, the Cote de Bar. And it's a very different far flung region than the kind of central one we're exploring today. But um, just to, uh, before I uh, go off on a major tangent, tangent, they just tend to be riper champagnes, period. If you have the natural ripeness that I think climate change and your specific site allows, you maybe don't need dosage, but there's others that really need a teeny bit of dosage to really bring out the aromatics and balance the acid, balance maybe the austere minerality. Um, there's a great interview with the... Uh, uh, the uh, chef to, uh, chief to cav of uh, Rotor, and they, you know, produces Cristal. And no one would argue that the recent vintages of Cristal are anything but extraordinary. And they still have dosage. And they, I think they've gone really matured in the sense of when they pick and when and how they choose to, to administer dosage. So, yeah. <laughs> You know, someone said that it's a little funky. And, you know, I, I don't know. Do you guys think the Payard is funky? I think it's complex. I think it does have almost some, some, some of that bruised aspect might, might be interpreted as funk. I, I don't quite, um, I don't quite agree as funky, maybe because I've tried some, you know, quote unquote, natural champagnes that the, the avant-garde are producing that are, are truly funky, <laughs> that are truly what you might call intentionally flawed. <laughs> no, I, I, I think it's more a style of, of the, the wine. I, I, again, I, I would um, respectfully say, no, it's, I don't think it's funky. I think it's the way it's meant to be, um, with the, this, this more yeasty, um, fuller style. So I think we should uh, go on to, I think, admittedly, one of my personal favorite champagnes. I, I drink this, I, yeah. I've already exactly. blown through a full case of half bottles uh, in the last few months myself, <laughs> so. <laughs> is, is, is that you testing for COVID? Do you wanna make sure that you can still smell and taste? Well, it was initially, uh, so this will actually, if I do have a wedding in June, this will be the wedding, uh, the, the champagne I toast with. So 
I, I, mean, I was going to try it and give it to friends, and, and, but I ended up just drinking it all myself. All right. Those restaurants do open. I mean, you've got a job. <laughs> Thank you, Gerard. <laughs> so right away, you will notice this is a rosé. And you also notice that it is a very dark rosé. And you'll see on the label, rosé de sunny. And that literally means rosé of blood. <laughs> and the reason they say this, um, and this is, I think, a... This is a very ancient style of rosé, and it's it's increasingly becoming popular. Um, within you know making rosé, you can make it th really three major different ways. You can either uh, press a red grape hard enough that you get some pigment just from the pressure, um, or you can blend red wine into white wine. And that is actually strictly illegal in most of Europe, but it is allowed, allowed in Champagne. And it, it uh, allows them a degree of control that is really, I think, uh, often utilized by the larger companies because it, obviously, if you're you know, a conglomerate, you, you want a degree of control in your, in your product that you're going to charge hundreds of dollars for, hopefully. Um, so this is... Uh, kind of the third major method, which is uh, what you call bleeding the tanks. And this is where instead of you know going straight to press, you will actually uh, leave it on the skins like you'd be producing a, a normal red wine. You would start, you know, maceration, which is, you know, fermentation in contact with the skins. Uh, they don't quite leave it long enough to actually start maceration, but you do start getting some pigment uh, you know, seeping out into the juice and, and being absorbed. And so they'll leave it on for, you know, a matter of hours to days, and they'll kind of dictate how much color you have. Uh, this is quite a bit of color, as you can see. And with the uh, leaching of color, you, you get also, you know, a little bit of body, maybe a little bit of tannin, not much, but it, 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 it uh, as you're about to taste, it gives a much uh, richer and rounder mouthfeel. Oh, to me, this is the essence of spring. It, it reminds me of uh, one, of my, one of my favorite songs by the Bill Evans trio, uh, You Must Believe in Spring. And it, it, to me, it's, it's, it's ripe strawberries, it's a rhubarb. Uh, there is some apple in there. It's just like a cornucopia of, of just fresh fruit and, and happiness. <laughs> I love this one. So um, this is Geoffroy, Champagne Geoffroy, Rene, uh, Rene Geoffroy. And this is one of my favorite grower producers. He is, and I'll share my screen with you to give you just a little, um, little context. We're going over to the other major central region. And this is the Valley de Marne. So this is about the Marne River. So away from boozy you can see there you can see there you can see the river coming through all these villages but it doesn't really create a valley until you you get over here and so this is kind of the start right around here is the beginning of the valley de marne and you can kind of see it, it gets steeper it's hemmed in by forest on both sides and and it, it go and extends these are all vineyards right here uh, hugging the hillsides, but it gets steep, pretty steep over here and kind of closed in compared to, you know, the open breathiness uh, of, of these, you know, vineyards over here. Um, so this is the beginning of the Valley de Marne I mentioned. So this is Pinot Noir country. So this is kind of the transition. So this comes from two different sites, kind of this, uh, the, the Cumier is a uh, kind of bowl shaped little area, really nice deep fruit tends to have just this natural, like kind of earthy richness that I really like. And then a little bit higher up here, these vineyards, I'm not gonna try to pronounce that. 
Um, but as you extend over here, and I should say, this is where you also see a transition in soil. And that is a major thing uh, when, you, when you talk about what grapes are, are, are planted. So it tends to be a little cooler over here and it also tends to be heavier in clay. So there is, you know, it's very limey still, but you have much more clay at the surface. It's deeper clay, so it holds more water and it just tends to marry with the Pinot Noir grape really, really well over here. As you transition further and further to the west, you start seeing uh, this is almost all Pinot Meunier country. And it's a, it's a beautiful grape. It is, you know, by far the highest, uh, the third largest planted grape in all of Champagne. But it's often seen as a, a blending grape. Um, more and more producers, uh, I think of uh, Christophe Mignon is a, is a classic producer who's trying to resurrect and really showcase that, you know, making single variety Pinot Meunier, it, it can be your extremely uh, challenging and beautiful wine. So I'm a huge fan of this area. Uh, this is really the transition though. So this is still, you know, purely Pinot Noir country. So what do you guys think? What is, what do you, Gerard and Simon, how do you feel about this wine? It's, um, it, it's a wine which, again, I think is very food friendly. Um, that, that's, you know, we, we, we talk so often about how when we're talking about still wines, whether it be Burgundies or Bordeaux or um, Alsace or where, whatever the region may be, and I just picked France, doesn't have to be, um, how they match certain foods. And I think this is, these three are prime examples of how you can enjoy the wines on their own, which we should certainly do from time to time, or as often as possible even, uh, but also with, um, with certain dishes. And again, with this one, I'm, I think I'm looking for a, a, a much more robust um, dish or even some cheeses to go with this. Um, it, it's, as, as Silas pointed out, it's quite dark in color for a rosé champagne. I mean, if, for example, one of my favorite rosé champagnes is from Tatouche, their Comte de Champagne, um, much lighter in color than this. Um, but, but again, this, this, this depth, this, this weight to, to the wine that makes it really, really interesting. And, and Comte de Champagne is, is a classic example of the other method of blending still Pinot in, into, yeah. into a Blanc de Blanc usually. So it gives you kind of a, it marries the two styles. Well, this is just, I think, a, a wholehearted effort into exploring what the Pinot Noir from these two small villages can, can give you. Yeah, I think this is almost a, you know, this is almost a, a transition into a still line, honestly. I mean, in terms of the, you know, the acidity isn't, you know, it's not, it's not, not a super high acid line, um, but it's a really, really nice wine. And I think, you know, for, for me, almost some, some red apple, some watermelon, um, it's an interesting wine. And honestly, it's, you know, for as much wine as we, we, we drink, I mean, this is a, this is a, this is a cool wine to, to try. And, you know, it may not be the, the most typical, but, you know, it's a really, really unique expression. And I would, this is an interesting one to pair and I'll kind of bounce it back to, um, you know, bounce it back to you. And if you were thinking like, what would you, what would you pair this with food wise? If it wasn't, I mean, you know, Simon mentioned some cheeses. I mean, if you were forced to on the fly kind of pair this and I'm kind of putting you on the spot here, but you know, what do you think food wise, what would this, what would this go with? Honestly, I, I would, um, roasted chicken. I would smash yeah. pocket chicken. Yeah, yeah, no, no, that's it's right in line, kind of with what I was thinking. Yeah, no, absolutely. Yeah. No, and I think I mentioned poultry. I, I think, you know, if you get the air, you got to get the, you know, obviously the aromatics right in terms of what herbs you use. But I think, you know, just a, a beautiful, um, hopefully locally sourced <laughs> chicken. Uh, and I, I don't think I would smoke it. I won't use green egg or anything. But um, yeah, just just getting a perfectly just delicious poultry yeah or even a guinea hen oh man maybe even a maybe in a great wine for a couple weeks ago you know we might have I should have had this uh, tasting pre-thanksgiving i almost think this would lend itself well to turkey too you know yeah i did drink this on thanksgiving <laughs> <laughs> of course you did <laughs> no so we do have a few questions um so yeah so christy you asked uh steel versus oak barrel what when it comes to, what is the difference between steel and oak barrel when it comes to aromatic taste? Oh my god, did my internet shut up? Um, 
in, in small, small print at the very bottom of the label, you'll see in, I think, all of these, uh, two letters, either RM or NM. And you'll see these on all, most champagnes. Some have something different, but the two, these are the two most important ones. RM, Recoltant Manipulant, which means grower producer, and NM, Negociant Manipulant, which means they buy the fruit and make the wine. And not that there's anything to, bad to say about NM and Negociant Manipulant because they have contracts with some of the, the finest grape growers and, and make some of the best champagnes um, in the region. But that's just a, if you're looking out for something and you want to, to try different wines that are made by the, ma the person, the people, the man or the woman who grows the grapes and makes the wine, look for RM on the label. And, and I should say, the I, I dove into the, the Pierre Piard is technically NM. And mm -hmm. I looked into it, and they, they own the majority of the land uh, and vineyard and farm it themselves. But they, even if you buy a little bit of grape <laughs> or juice, you legally have to become a negotiant. It, it, yeah. it, they, yeah. they do not leave any room in the system. It is very strict, as I said. So, uh, and... Uh, they always joke, you know, those jokes around Champagne about the big houses trucking grapes from the Jura, the neighbor. <laughs> and, and, but truth be told, it, 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 it's highly regulated. And if you're caught, it, 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 it can be a national scandal when, when you're caught, you know, flouting these rules because it is, it is held dear and it is a, literally a national treasure, as, as it probably should be. I mean, they're, they're breathtaking, breathtaking ones. We've got some recipe recommendations here on some dishes. Oh, yeah, here. I know. Braised strawberries, <laughs> with tropical fruit salsa. salsa. I, I agree with that one. I think that uh, something like a, you know, like a, a fuller bodied fish, something like a halibut yeah. would be a halibut with a tropical fruit salsa. Yeah. So I'm in. So well done, Karen. Yeah. <laughs> so, so just for fun, I've, I've created a little poll that I'll just, I'll. Uh, oh. At least I thought I did. <laughs> Look at the um, the cork from the rosé, in particular. And if you look at the base of the cork, you'll see it's actually laminated. There's there's different layers of cork and different styles of cork. Um, and the reason for that is that the really top top quality portion of cork goes on the base of the cork, which touches the wine. And then because of economics and, and, and the ability to be able to squeeze the cork to get into the bottle, they use other corks further up. And when a cork goes into a champagne bottle, it's straight. It is absolutely dead straight and, and like that. And over the years, as it stays in the bottle, it takes the shape of the neck of the bottle. So obviously only the bottom half of the cork, the bottom two, thir two thirds of the cork actually goes into the glass and the rest is, is this mushroom shape. But when it first goes in, it's absolutely dead straight all the way around. I've, so got, a few, I've got a few tartrates on the bottom of my cork there, which is a <laughs> fun sign. So please, uh, if you have any questions, throw them in the chat. I'm going to say one thing about the other regions of Champagne. Uh, there's some really fascinating things happening in kind of the more far-flung areas of Champagne. So, you know, just south of the Cote de Blancs, uh, you just have areas that are just traditionally exclusively supplying grapes to the large houses. And in recent years, a few, you know, growers have decided to start bottling their own wines um, or have sold land to really you know, forward thinking, often internationally trained or uh, trained in other regions, these, these young producers who want to push the boundaries of, of what can be done in Champagne. And it, it's extremely exciting. So a couple of producers to look out for, uh, uh, Ulysse Colleen, um, he's doing some amazing stuff, very low dosage, very beautiful, ripe wines. I, I would, I would, you know, similar to almost a, a sparkling uh, Grand Cru Chablis is the best thing I can describe it as. Uh, also down in the Cote de Bar, 
uh, Marie Coltin. She is an incredible natural producer. So she does not use any sulfur, uh, no dosage, and it, it just breathtaking wines. And, and there's some really interesting stuff going on down south. And that, that's a region, you know, it's, it's, it's closer to Chablis than it is the center of Champagne, where these wines that we've been tasting are. And they actually shares a different geologic formation uh, that it shares the same geologic formation as Chablis. So it's very different, very old uh, limestone marls from a very different uh, time period in history. So it, much more akin to, to Chablis period. <laughs> so yeah, beautiful wines. I'd highly recommend uh, looking out for those. Did you have a poll? I, I, it was not published. So we're gonna oh, OK. All well, right. Do, oh, go ahead. I, I was going to, I, obviously, Silas, you, you, you will finish this up. But I, I'd like to finish, assuming we are finishing, by thanking you all for joining us um, and certainly wishing you all safe and, and healthy, very important, healthy holidays. And there's a quote on champagne from Madame Lily Bollinger, who's one of the famous ladies of Champagne, the widow Clicquot and Bollinger, um, two, two widows who, who built their Champagne houses after the, the passing of their husbands. And she wrote, and you may have heard this quote before, but it's, it's a wonderful quote. I drink Champagne when I'm happy and when I'm sad. Sometimes I drink it when I'm alone. When I have company, I consider it obligatory. I trifle with it when I'm not hungry, and drink it when I am. Otherwise, I never touch it unless I'm thirsty. I'm thirsty. We did actually have a couple couple good questions uh, trickle into the chat, so why don't we stick around and uh, answer those. Um, first one being from Karen Stowe and, and Silas. Uh, so can you tell us more about the, well, I think we might be all using different, are we all using different glasses? But these glasses versus the, uh, the Riedel's. Um, so I, I have Riedel's and I enjoy Riedel's. I prefer, this is a small Austrian company called Gabriel Glass. And it is just beautiful, very, very thin, mouth blown. So it's a single piece. And uh, Riedel does make mouth blown single piece glasses, but they charge four times as much. <laughs> so I, I really, I enjoy the delicacy and the weightlessness of a mouth bone glass because there's no joints, there's no, uh, it, it's perfectly in balance and it just helps me think less about what I'm holding and just think about the wine. Uh, I'm also just addicted to buying glassware. So I have <laughs> an incredible collection. Uh, I have nothing, no, no problem with Riedel. I, I do think they almost make too many different styles. Uh, a lot of, Champagne producers will actually show their wines in the glasses that Riedel makes for their specific uh, variety. So they'll use a Pinot Noir glass, which Riedel actually designs for a, a Burgundy. Uh, they'll use a Pinot Noir glass for a Blanc de Noir, for a, a, a you know something or a rosé like the Jacques Roy made with Pinot Noir, and vice versa. They'll use a Chardonnay glass to show a Blanc de Blanc made from Chardonnay. So the next question, which is glass related, uh, is why am I not using traditional champagne glasses? Well, um, let, let's ask the questioner, um, what do you mean by traditional? Because back in the days, the champagne coupe, which was the model that looked like a, a, a saucer, was traditional. Then it became the champagne flute. Um, these days, we all use um, larger, bold um, white wine glasses or even red wine glasses. Um, I, because I don't have the fixation with wines, wine glasses that, that, that Silas and, 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 and Gerard do, um, I, I'm, I'm using Spiegelau white wine glass. Um, I could have used a red wine glass, it would have looked bigger, but um, these, these days, everybody's moving away from, excuse me, moving away from the, um, from the champagne flute 
because you just can't get the aromas of, of the wine. The bubbles are great because they're all tight and close together. And of course, the coop, which was the, the, the saucer, um, everything just dissipated into the air and it was, it was um, no. So I, I'm using Spiegelau white wine. Um, then next question, though, somebody asked about RM and NM. Does it apply to all French wines? No, only to Champagne, as far as I'm aware. Um, and any other wine region in France um, does not indicate whether they are growers and producers or uh, buy fruit. Um, but in most instances, um, if you're buying, say, a Burgundy, you'll know it's coming from a Negocion because, because yeah. the Negocion names are clearly um, advertised, um, you know, Drouin and Bouchard and, and the like, whereas the grower producers in Burgundy, um, no, they, they, they domain so-and-so, domain such-and-such. Yeah, and I, I, is that, I don't know if that's a legal distinction. I, I, I think it actually might be where they cannot claim domain unless, they've, unless they own the, the vineyards. Uh, I'm thinking of uh, Henri Bouillot. Uh, he actually distinguishes between the grapes he owns, the vineyards he owns and the ones he buys from. Uh, so you'll see, you say he owns, he owns a plot in Bataille Montmarche and he'll say domain Henri Bouillot, but he does not own Coton Charlemagne, for instance, and it'll be just Henri Bouillot. Um, question addressed to me, but I think it's probably for you, Silas. Spelling on glass you are using. Spending on it? <laughs> spelling, spelling. Oh, spelling. Uh, it's like uh, G A B R I E L G L A S. We can we can let you know tomorrow. <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah. But I will say, Silas turned uh, turned me on to the uh, Gabriel Gloss, and they are in uh, <laughs> getting you know getting a, a good workout because I love them and I've passed them along to you know some friends and some family, and it's just it's just a good example. I mean, we, sometimes we overcomplicate it when it comes to the glassware. I mean, obviously, drink you know glass that you're most comfortable with that makes you you know just take it as you know as, as seriously or as, as casually as you like. Um, but you know, the, the, there is something about a good wine glass, um, that really just does, does enhance the experience. I mean, there's a time and a place we talk about flutes. I mean, there's nothing wrong with, literally, there's nothing wrong with flutes for champagne. Do they give you the true essence of champagne itself? Probably not, but there's, you know, there's something to be said for the celebratory, casual, fun aspect that flutes provide. But if you do want to, you know, really, really dig into the champagne, um, you know, it would be interesting if you were to line these three wines up side by side and then do the same pours yeah. with some flutes. And you probably, you know, and not even probably, I mean, you would not get the same experience that we're all enjoying um, tonight. And, and again, if anybody is enjoying out of flutes right now, again, it's not to say there's anything wrong with it, but I do encourage you to pour it into, you know, pour a you know, little bit that you've got left into, into a glass and revisit. And I, I trust the experience will just be a lot different. So now I think, uh, you know, to, to the, as far as the Gabriel glass go, I mean, that's, Really, I'm a big fan of those. Um, but you know, anything that you know allows you to really, really experience the wine—that's the most important thing. Yes, I, I totally agree. I think, um, and the biggest keyword there is wine. I think, you know, moving away from flutes and coupes, it helps you realize that champagne is a very serious wine. It's not just an aperitif. You know, it, um, it. it you know, it has the aromas, it has the ageability, it has the complexity of any top wine in the, in the world. And I think bigger glasses just help you appreciate those aromas. When, it, when a coupe, you know, obviously doesn't really help with anything, but uh, a flute, it, it doesn't trap the aroma, it doesn't let you really experience it in the same way that a bigger bowl would. I, try, I tried to make that clear in the, in the email prior, but uh, before the tasting, and, and no problem if, if you don't have this capability since it really isn't. But um, the other thing is, I, you know, there's other brands too. Zalto is a really nice brand. And why I've settled on this is because I enjoy glasses like these uh, with almost every one. Like mm -hmm. there's some exceptions. I'll go to a larger bowl for a, a very delicate Pinot Noir or, or, or aged Barolo. And that's just because I, I want to smell it even more. Like, you know, a very large bowl with a tight lip. Um, for instance, this is like the Conterno glass. This is actually designed by um, by, by the uh, famous Barolo producer. And, and let me tell you, it 
does very well Barolo <laughs> and Peter Noir. <laughs> um, but yeah, I, I like it. I like to have one set of glasses that will just blow me away with any wine I try. Yeah. The, the other interesting observation with those glasses that you have is they are so light. They, they are featherweight. It's, it's yeah. remarkable. Uh, Christy, I appreciate the offer. I am going to hang out with my fiance because she has been waiting <laughs> patiently to see me all day. So I really appreciate it. But for the sake of my relationship, <laughs> I'm going to pass. Uh, or do we have any other questions? So I'm actually, you know, before we wrap up, it, it's interesting because, you know, the, the uh, in terms of how long, you know, all of us have been drinking champagne or enjoying champagne and then, you know, having those kind of aha moments with serious champagne. I'm asking this to be a question for Simon. Um, you know, at what point in, you know, because this is just for historical reference and context, I mean, at what point did, at least in your estimation, you really sort of have your own aha moment or maybe that the, 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 you know, the, the bracket of years when growers became very, very serious, you know, as opposed to, you know, just not just the houses. Yeah, that, that, that's, a, that's a good question. I mean, I, I've been in the wine industry since, um, well, the dark ages. And um, I, I, when I came to the States in 1980, um, it was still very much um, negotiant, you know, Berkeley, Gautat and Jay Mowat, the, the, the big names and, and nothing uh, along the lines that we experience today. And I would think it's probably been in the last 20 years or so um, that I've seen more and more of, of these grower producer wines coming to the market. I think one of the people who has been um, very much a, a, a leader of, of introducing us to these was, is Terry Thies, mm -hmm. who's, who's um, if you ever read his newsletters, you, <laughs> you need an hour just to read his newsletter. <laughs> But um, and, and it's fascinating reading. But he was, I think, I'm not sure that he was the only one, but he was certainly one of the first importers that I was aware of that was was um, flying the banner for grower producers. And of course, as that happened, and there was more popularity than for grower producers, they, the grower producers, realized that they could actually make money making their own wine and selling their own wine rather than selling the fruit to the big houses. And that was exponential and, and has, has grown from that. So we see it more and more, and Silas has named names this evening, but quite honestly, I've yeah. never heard of So. I'll, I'll bring some in. <laughs> <laughs> no, and, and, and you mentioned Terry Thies. Two of these wines are from the Terry Thies catalog. Yeah. And uh, that's one thing I should say, how I really deep dived into champagnes when I moved to Chicago. Um, you know, I had access to all these distributors working in the trade and I just, I just marched through, uh, each village, honestly. And one of the biggest, uh, helps was, and if you ever are interested in learning more about champagne, uh, find the book uh, Champagne by Peter Liam. And Peter Liam is actually a, a Portland native, just like me. So I, I have a soft spot for him, but he was one of the more, I think he was the first critic to just move to Champagne. And he lives in Champagne. He lives and breathes Champagne. And the man knows so much about every single village and is dedicated to just sharing the best way, sharing each unique uh, you know, aspect of the terroir of each village, but also letting you know, he gives you a laundry list of which specific bottlings from which producer are from that village and will help you explore what makes that unique. It, it, it's, it's an incredible resource and I highly recommend. And it's a great coffee table book because <laughs> it comes with maps. <laughs> maps maps are, are so important and, and I, I would just plug, not just for champagne, but a book that, that I have bought every edition of since it was first published is Hugh Johnson's World Atlas of Wine. And if, if you don't have a copy, um, you really should get one. Um, it won't go into the detail that we've been going into this evening, but it 
has wonderful maps. And I love being able to have a glass of wine in front of me and look it up in the map and see pinpointed on that map where it's come from. So Hugh Johnson's World Atlas of Wine, I think the eighth edition is the last one, which is now about a year old, but uh, well, well worth buying. Uh, we don't sell books, so I'm not plugging it. <laughs> and, and I hope that, you know, the using Google Earth helped you guys a little bit situate where we were in terms of, and I wish you could come to Champagne and, and, and it's so helpful, you know, personally growing up being in vineyards, working in vineyards. And it's easy to talk about these things about how the clay content does this and that. But when you go there and you see, wow, this soil is so different than the vineyard I was in 10 minutes ago. And it, it <clears throat> drive that home. And you just can't see that from a map, honestly. It's 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 challenging. <laughs> so I, I, I recommend visiting Champagne and I, recommend visiting any region, any wine region you love. And it, it, it always helps me ground myself and uh, makes every bottle, every subsequent bottle ev that much more rewarding and, and, and nostalgic. Quick question, we're, 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 gonna, we're gonna wrap up soon, but somebody asked me what the book, <clears throat> there you go. The World Atlas of Wine, eighth edition, Hugh Johnson and Jancis Robinson. So just to knock out a couple questions, rapid fire. Um, first and foremost, for, me, for those that have been in the chat and thank I mean, just broadly speaking, thank you for everybody for joining us. And for those that have been, you know, complimentary in the chat and, and we, we you know we, we appreciate the time that you guys are, are all spending with us. And, and, you know, I believe somebody mentioned as far as, you know, being very complimentary and, and, and mentioning how, you know, the, the, we, we know that there's, the, there's all kinds of, you know, maybe Zoom type events, whether they be, um, very elaborate, ready to be very casual on the fly. I mean, we, you know, we appreciate the, the time that everyone's spending with us and, and we do our best. I mean, we talk about, you know, wanting to make this fun and casual and informative at the same time. So, you know, we want to do a, a, as much as we can to kind of deep dive and add some value to it. Um, but, you know, at the end of the day, it's wine and, and we, we want to leave the pretense aside. So we're talking about serious stuff, but, you know, as you can see, we're all, you know, having a good time and, and we're looking forward to more of these, I think kind of segueing into that uh, I think there was a, a, a question about uh, from Jose about uh, asking about New World versus Old World Pinot Noir tasting. My response to that would be, Jose, where were you a couple months ago when we did Burgundy versus Oregon? Um, <laughs> right up your alley. But uh, <laughs> um, I believe there was also a question about Italy, which is has definitely been discussed. It's one of those things where, you know, I think it's... <sighs> Italy is it, it has so many you know has so many possibilities, but I feel like we you know we almost need to to provide a food pairing with it to make it go the right way, or to really really selectively curate those right wines because you know obviously we want the wines to be we want the wines to show well. That's the biggest thing. I mean, and and transitioning into you know another. I mean, just we're talking about uh, Napa and the Rhone. So Napa and the Rhone are. are Two that are kind of in the uh, in the queue, kind of uh, up next on deck. But you know, whether it be Napa, whether it be the Rhone, whether it be Italy, you know, the most important thing is we want to we want to have impressive lines, but we also want the lines to show well, so we can talk about them and appreciate them. You know, I mean, obviously, we all have lines in our cellar that are great lines to to look at and say one day we'll we'll pull those corks and you know enjoy them, and a decade from now, or maybe even you know just four or five years from now. But as it goes right now, I mean, we're we're looking forward to finding the right Italian wines and they're out there. And the nice thing about our inventory and our, and our uh, uh, connections is that we can access them. So the Italy is definitely in the cards, uh, might not be next in the pipeline, but we'll, we'll definitely keep you posted. Um, I believe there's a question maybe from Doug about uh, these bottles availability. I can't speak for Silas, but I believe the answer is yes. And that you'll follow up tomorrow. Is that right? Or at least in the next couple of days with what is out there? Yep, they're all available in both formats. I'll, I'll, I'll follow up in an email tomorrow. Uh, and the recording as well with, uh, will be posted on YouTube tomorrow. But yes, to short answer, yes, they're all, they're all available. And if you also want to explore other champagnes, please let me know. I, I, I love sharing my love <laughs> of champagne. And honestly, it's, it, it's, it's, uh, it's honestly a great time to support champagne because you know, while they have not been affected by the, by the tariffs that have been ongoing, and, and decimating a lot of people's livelihoods. Uh, for some reason or another, sales of champagne have plummeted during, during COVID uh, when other wine sales have, have skyrocketed. 
So it, it's a great time to support these, you know, these fam truly family operations. Um, I know for a fact that, that many of them are, are struggling to sell. I don't want to leave Bill out. Bill asked uh, what, what the question maybe to, to tie it all together and wrap it up, but uh, favorite grower producer for us. I mean, for me, I mean, it's, uh, I think that uh, said a really, really nice bottle of the Mondo Avernia. I thought it was fantastic. Um, but Silas, I mean, the growers are right up your alley. So, you know, <laughs> it's like maybe your top five. Yeah, that's, that's really tough. Um, the uh, there's a grower in the Cote de Bar called I'm butchering his name is a, a, a Boe Sobe, and they produce these phenomenal wines. I mean, just like, oh, <laughs> want to take a stab at the spelling of his last name or the spelling of the house's last name? <laughs> oh, it's V V O U T T E S O R B E E. I mean, that's getting real wine geeky. That's getting really geeky right there. I mean, yes, that's, that's, that's pretty fun. <laughs> this, yeah, this, this is getting very. <laughs> <laughs> you asked. <laughs> um, oh, oh, oh I, my, my answer would be I don't know because I'm still trying. I'm still trying them. Yeah. Um, there's, there's, there's so many out there now, and it's so much fun to be able to take the opportunity to, to go out and, and buy a bottle here and a bottle there and try them. And um, yeah, again, obviously, it, it's, it's I, I think one of the fun things for me with wine is that although it's my business, I sell it and um, I, I feed my starving family with it. Thank you all very much. Um, it, it's something I learn every day. And there, is, there isn't a day that doesn't go by when I don't learn something new uh, about wine and about um, whether it's champagne or whatever it may be. Uh, and that's one of the, the absolute most fun things about being in this business is that even if I go to Bordeaux every year, the wine I tasted last year is now a year older and it's changed and so on and so on and so on. It never stops and it's so much fun. And uh, this has been a blast. I, I just love this. Yeah, I agree. Good job, Silas. Oh, thank you. And uh, uh, Richard, I uh, I I love Salas. I cannot afford Salas. <laughs> is the is the short answer. Uh, yeah, it's the same thing. I would say, oh yeah, I'd love to drink Salon every night. <laughs> yeah. I, can, I cannot. <laughs> um, but yeah, thank you all so much for joining. Uh, this was honestly a, a project of passion for me. And I'm, I'm really happy it came together like it did. And I'm, I'm happy that so many people signed up. And um, yeah, we're, we're hoping to uh, have some more tastings that incorporate half bottles or whole bottle options that we can ship outside the States, outside of Illinois, and, and you know, include as many people as, as you know, we can. So yeah, keep an eye out for our future tastings. We're really excited. Well done, Silas. And thank you all again, really. Yeah. Happy holidays, everyone. Yeah, Most happy importantly, holidays. happy holidays. All right, thank you all. Goodbye.